Hi everyone, welcome to week 11 of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to be talking more about Git. Now we looked at Git in the past in this class, I think it was week 5 that we talked about it last, and then we looked at Git as sort of a way of managing files just with one person working on a project, just on one computer. So in week 5 we looked at, for instance, you could make a directory for a project that you're working on, for a class let's say, and you could use Git to sort of track your changes of that project as you're working on it. So that if you accidentally deleted a file, you could restore it back to the last version that Git had saved. Or if you had messed something up, you know, like tried to fix a bug but actually made things worse, you could go back in time and either see how you did things before originally or go back to a previous version, sort of selectively undoing the changes that you've made. That alone, I think, is a worthwhile usage of Git. I have many, many Git repositories, most of which aren't online anywhere, most of which are just local, like we talked about in week five, just so that if I screw something up, I won't lose my work. But this week, we're going to talk about how you can actually do a little bit more with Git. And in this way, we're going to talk about how you can use Git to collaborate between multiple different programmers. So most large software projects aren't written just by one person, of course. Most large software projects are written by a whole team of people that potentially changes over time. If you are running a major program uh, like a web browser or uh, anything else, a game, anything, that software had you know hundreds and hundreds of people working on it more than likely over a span of multiple years. And so Git isn't just for one person sort of working on a project and tracking the changes that one person makes, but rather tracking the changes that many people are submitting all at the same time or you know potentially over the over the same course of time. So today we'll look at how we can do that with Git. The, there's multiple ways that this could be done. We could sort of use Git just in, of itself, but if we need to communicate with other people, we have to set up some sort of communication system. And like I said, you actually could do this just with Git in and of itself, but most people use a hosting service to use alongside of Git, and so that way it provides sort of the, the interface by which multiple people connect their repositories up together and share the information across. Now, there's lots of, uh, or at least several different of these hosting services that host Git repositories. The most popular one is called GitHub. And many people, in fact, have heard of GitHub before Git. I dare say GitHub is more popular or uh, more widely known than Git in and of itself because GitHub is such a, such a popular website for hosting software projects and things. But GitHub and Git actually uh, are sort of different things. You can use Git entirely without GitHub. Uh, and indeed, we saw how to do that in week five. But GitHub provides sort of a web interface by which you can create Git repositories and hook up multiple users to the same Git repository. So this week, we're going to look at how you can make a GitHub user, how you can use GitHub to make repositories hosted on the GitHub website, how you can connect those or repositories up to your own local computer so that you can be on your own local computer working on something and then send the changes to GitHub where other people can see them and access them and potentially build on top of them. We'll also look at things that can come up when you have multiple people working on the same repository together. For instance, if you make one change to a file that's not compatible with the change that somebody else makes to a file, that creates something called a merge conflict where Git does not know how to sort of reconcile those two changes. And so we'll look at when that can happen and the way that that can be fixed. Luckily, Git makes it pretty much as easy and painless as it could be to, to fix things like that. So first, we'll start talking about, I think, the way that we can hook up multiple repositories together. Okay, so like I said, we're going to use GitHub in order to share information from one person's version of the project to another. And so, as we saw in week five, this sort of core unit of measurement that a Git project uses is called a repository. The repository stores all of the files of the project and also all the history of those files. So not just sort of the current state of them that we have, but also all of the history, all of the changes, everything like that, the complete set of all of the snapshots that GitHub, or rather just Git tracks. And so we'll create several repositories potentially now. 
Repository is often abbreviated as repo, R-E-P-O, by the way. And so this might be, you know, you over here and then your partners, partner A, let's call them, and partner B also have their own version of the repository. And so now, like I said, it is in theory possible for you to sort of send your changes back and forth with Git without using anything else, but it is very inconvenient to do that. And so what we're going to do is with GitHub, we're going to make the centralized repository or the central repo. And so this is going to serve as sort of the, the standard repository, the one that uh, contains like the official version of things. And so we're not going to actually interact directly between you and your partners. Instead, you're going to send your changes to the centralized repository doing an operation called push. So you'll still work locally and you'll still make changes to your own files and you'll do the things that we talked about in week five, like committing the changes, maybe going back and undoing some of the changes you'd made, looking back at your own history, but and essentially you're going to be committing your own work to your own repository. Then you'll push those changes to the centralized repo where they will take effect and those changes will be made to the centralized version of the repository as well. Then what will happen is your partners will download your changes. So the centralized repository sort of acts as the go-between for sending your changes and then uh, sending them on to your partners. So your partners will each download your changes that you make doing an operation called pulling. So push is to send the changes, the commits from your local repository on your own computer or on the CPSC server up to the centralized repo, which is hosted by GitHub in our case. And then pull is to download the latest changes, the latest commits, and have them applied from the centralized repo down to your own code. So when you do a push, you're changing the code that's stored in the centralized repository. And when you're doing a pull, you're changing the code that is stored on your own computer. Now that partner A and partner B, the two partners you're working with, now that they have your local code, they might make changes of their own, and then they would want to push their changes back up. So partner A could push their changes up to the centralized repository, and then you can pull them back from the centralized repository to your own computer. So this is how it works. You sort of each are independently working on the project. Then when you want to share something, you push your commits up to the centralized repository, which changes this, which is sort of the official version of the program that's online and available. Then when you want to update your code to the newest version from the centralized repository, you do a pull. One important thing is that you can't push if you don't have the most up-to-date version of the program. So let's say that we go back a little bit and partner B has not yet pulled the code. They have sort of an out-of-date version of the software on their own local computer and they try to push their changes up. Well, what Git will say is it will say, hey, you can't push these changes to the centralized repository because you are behind. You aren't up to date with the most recent commits from you and partner A. That's what it'll tell partner B. And so it'll force you first to do a pull. So it'll force you to download the most recent changes before you go and push it up. That way you can sort of fix this and make sure that nothing you've done has interfered or messed up what the other people have done. All right, so now let's talk about what you would sort of actually do, what it actually looks like to use GitHub and to work with it. So what you would do is you would go to the GitHub website, which uh, I have here, and you would create a user by clicking sign up, and then it uh, gives you this um, uh, where you enter your email and you will pick a username and a password, of course, and it will also, I believe, make you verify your email address. I'm not going to do that because I already have an account, so I'll just sign into my account that I already have. So then, after you have an account, you're going to have to do a couple of setup things first. The first thing that you'll have to do is add your SSH keys. So the way that GitHub sort of like verifies that you are who you say you are is through SSH keys. So again, if we were to go back to this diagram over here, um, if we are, you know, partner A or you, as I've labeled it on this diagram, 
if we're you, we're sending our changes, our commits, over the internet to the centralized repository. Well, Git needs to somehow verify that we are who we say we are. It doesn't just let random people push to the repository. That would be kind of chaos. It would let anyone sort of commit changes to the different projects. And so the way that it verifies that the person sending the commits um, with git push are from who they say they are is through SSH keys. If you remember, we talked way back in week one about SSH keys and how you can use them to securely log in from your own local computer to the CPSC server. Now we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to make SSH keys from the CPSC server to the GitHub website. That way we can essentially log on over SSH every time that we send a push, um, git push from our own local repository to the GitHub centralized repository. So if you come over here and you click on your sort of settings section, you can go to the settings part right here and that will open this up and then you can click on the SSH and GPG keys over here. Then you'll click new SSH key and you can give it a title. We can give it like CPSC server, for instance, as an SSH key. Then we actually have to make the SSH key. And the way that we can do that is by using this command. You'll do this on the CPSC server itself. You'll do the command SSH dash key gen like this. Then you'll hit enter and it will ask where you want it to go. Just hit enter to go with the default. Give it no passphrase, I think is probably the best. That way you don't need to type a password every single time you do a git push. And this will generate an SSH key for you. If you look in the SSH subdirectory in your home directory, it will generate IDRSA, which is your private key. You should not share that with anybody. And IDRSA.pub, which is the public key. The public key is going to go to GitHub and that actually can be shared. It's uh, the way that uh, some uh, asymmetric keys work is sort of beyond the scope of uh, 225 really in general, but the public key can be made public. That's why it's called that. But the private key can, has to be kept secret. If somebody gets your private key in this scenario, they'll be able to push commits into GitHub in your name, which you don't want to have happen. So we'll cat this public key, not the private key, but the public key onto the screen. Then we can copy it. So the way that this works depends on your terminal, I expect. Uh, if you're using PuTTY, I think just selecting it will copy it. I will do Control Shift C on this Linux terminal to copy it. Then we will go back to the browser over here and we'll paste it in. So you paste it in just like that. Then you can click Add SSH Key. And now we should have created this SSH key down here, which will allow us to securely send changes to the GitHub website and have them be authenticated. OK, so now once we've done that, you will need to make a actual repository. So you can do that, I think, by maybe going back to the home page of GitHub. And then you see there's this new repository button right here. You can click that. And then it's going to be asking you for a repository name. I'll call it, let's say, project one. Oops, I already made project one uh, as an example for the notes page for this. Let me call it, I suppose, um, example project. That's fine, example. Then you can give it a description. You don't need to. This will just sort of add the text to the readme file for this. Um, I'll put an example project uh, to demonstrate. GitHub is fine. Choosing if it's public or private is sort of a semi-important decision. If you make it as a private repository, then that means that people just browsing GitHub won't be able to see the code that you have put inside of it. If you make it private, however, you'll be limited to having just three other people that you can work with on it. That might be OK. It might not be OK. It sort of excuse me, depends on the project that you're working on. If it, you make it public, 
everyone on the internet would be able to see it. This might cause problems if you're using GitHub for one of your classes, because if one of your instructors gave you an assignment and you make it public and you put it on GitHub, then potentially all of your classmates can see your code, which your instructor might have a problem with. And so uh, think before you um, decide to make it public or private. If it's a private repository, that's probably safest, but then you can only have at most three people working on the project. I'll make this one public because who cares? It's just an example thing. Then we choose to add a readme file. The reason for doing this is that you can uh, immediately download the code because there will be something there. It just puts a readme file in with like the name of the thing and your little description here. I usually do that so I can immediately download something. You can also choose to add a .git ignore. If you remember when we talked about this in week five, the .git ignore file lets you sort of like tell Git to ignore certain types of files. And that can be helpful, for example, if you're using Python. Python, when you run programs, makes this pi cache that stores like the bytecode version of your code. And you don't want to commit that because it was going to be constantly updated and it's just going to sort of create noise in the repository. You'll see all these diffs for this file that like you don't really care about. Likewise, if you're doing Java, you would have all these dot class files. And so if you choose uh, to add a git ignore for a certain programming language, it'll put in the things that should commonly be ignored. Like for Java, it'll include all the dot class files for instance. Then you can also choose a license. You don't need to do this, but if you want to have a certain software license, you can do that. Uh, we can leave it as none. That's fine. Then we'll click Create Repository. And then it will give us this. This has sort of shows you the GitHub interface where we can see the details of our project. There's lots of things that we can give to this. The project can have like a wiki. It can have uh, issues, which are like bug reports for it that people can make. Pull requests are where other people who aren't really part of your project can sort of suggest code to you, and you can then accept their changes into your project even though you're like not really working with them. It's a cool thing for like open soft source software where just anybody can find a project that they care about and try to make changes to it and get them accepted into the code base, which is neat. The main thing, though, is this code tab here, which sort of lists all of the files that you have. Right now, we only have one commit because we just made this brand new project. But eventually, you'll be able to browse through the commits just like you can on the command line, but using this web interface, which some people might find more helpful. You can click on any of these files. So if we click on .git ignore, it'll give us the code for it, as you can see here. You can see it does give us star.class, so it ignores all those. And then there's other sorts of things that it puts in here, like .jar files, which are sort of packaged up Java programs, zip files in tar.gz, so that if you like make a compiled version of your program, a package for it, it will ignore that from Git as well. And so these are sort of dependent on the programming language. Because we put Java, it put Java things, like BlueJ is a uh, Java IDE, and I guess it has some specific type of file that should be ignored. The README is actually what you see here. It's in Markdown, and so the, there's some like simple formatting inside of here. If we click on README.md, we'll see that it is looking like this. If we look at the raw view, it'll show us that it just looks like this. It's basically just a text file with some formatting. The pound sign makes this the title, and so it shows it up sort of in bold like this. But right now, we don't actually have any real files inside of here yet. So there's two things we could do with this project right now. We could either download it ourselves locally so that we can start working on it, or we can add other collaborators, which you don't need to do in this class. In CompSci 225, you don't need to add any collaborators. But I'll put it in this video so that if you are working on a project in one of your other classes, then you will be able to see how this process works. So what we would do is we would come over to the project settings, so not our settings for our whole user, which is uh, in the menu here but rather this settings uh, link here, which is just for this particular project. We'll come over down here, and this gives us lots of different settings for the project overall. But what we'll click is this collaborators um, button here. 
and that will allow us to invite people to work on the project with us. So if you have a group project and you have two teammates, you would click add people here and then you would search for the person. So uh, if I search for myself, um, I don't think I'll come up as my own self, but there's other people, as you can see, with similar names as me. Ian Finlayson's actually not that uncommon of a, of a name as you might think. But you'll search for your teammates either by their name or their GitHub username, if you know what that is, or by their email address that they signed up to GitHub with. Then when you find them, you'll, um, <laughs> if I was to invite this person, then I would click Add Ian to the repository, which I'm not going to do because I don't know who that is. Um, and then they would get an email address where they would accept the invitation, and then they would be listed as collaborators inside of this project along with us. And then both of us would be able to submit changes, submit our Git pushes up to the repository, and make changes just as e we'd be on equal footing as each other. But in this case, we're not actually going to do that. So if I come back to the repository itself, the next thing we'll talk about doing is how do we actually download this repository so that we can start working on it and making changes. We'll do that by clicking this code button here, which gives us a couple of options. We can either download a zip, which would download the code for us, but it doesn't let us actually like make changes to it. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to clone the repository. This is another git command, just like git uh, commit and git add and git pull and git push, which we'll see. There's also git clone, which allows us to download a repository over the internet, not just the code for it, but like the permissions and all of the history and basically everything that goes along with the git repository. All of that will be downloaded when we clone it. And so there's different ways we can clone it. HTTPS, you don't want to do. GitHub CL, CLI, you don't want to do. We'll want to do the SSH setting, which is why it's the default here. So then we copy this. There's a copy button, or you can just copy it sort of the, uh, the normal way of clicking uh, Control-C or whatever. Then once we've done that, we're going to go back to our terminal. So let me pull up a terminal window again, and we'll come over here. Then we go to wherever we want the repository to be. Oops, I have some old things here. I don't have something called example, so I can download it here. And we'll do the git clone command, and then we'll paste in the repository name that we copied from GitHub. Make sure it looks like this. It starts with like git at github.com, and it doesn't have like HTTPS in it. You don't want to copy like the actual like HTML web pages address. You want to copy the Git web page, or not the Git web page, but rather the Git direct link that is in that little SSH window. Once we do that, it will give us this message if we have not done this before, because it's using a new SSH key, and we can say yes. And then it should give us the list of known host. Yeah, this this says uh, SSH. Basically, we're adding GitHub as a known host. It sort of warns you the first time you connect to a new server using SSH, but we say that's fine. We trust GitHub. We can do this. And then if you look at this, it succeeded. It downloaded the files. It downloaded the Git repository. So now if we do ls, this directory has been added. The example directory contains the Git repository we just cloned. So we can cd into it and see that we have a file called readme.md. If we open this up, this contains the, just the exact text that we saw on the GitHub website. It has the name of the repository and the little description we put in there. Also, if we do ls minus a, we'll see our .git ignore was put in here, and also the .git directory, which if you remember, that contains all of like the history and the metadata and all that kind of stuff that Git is tracking for us. If we open git ignore, we'll see that, again, it looks like just the same thing we saw on the GitHub website. It contains sort of just the, the things that Java should ignore. So now we have a Git repository, and we can do things with it. We can make changes to it. One simple change we can make is to change this readme. Maybe I will add a line to this and say it is a simple Java program, something like that. We can save and quit. And now if we do git status, it will tell us, of course, that we have changed this file. 
I can do git commit a to say commit all of the changes, in this case, just the readme file. It brings up this commit message writing area in Vim where I can say um, added to the description, uh, something like that. And then if I save and quit, right now we haven't actually changed the centralized repository. When you do a git commit, you're only changing your local version of it. This allows you to sort of track the changes that just you are making and only when you want to share them with others do you need to send it to the centralized repository. Like we said, that's done with git push. If we list git status right now, it will say that our branch is ahead of origin main by one commit. That tells us that we have all of our local changes committed, but we have done things that aren't sent to the uh, origin slash main, which is how git refers to the centralized report repository. Origin is the name of the centralized repository itself, and main is the main branch of that repository. It tells us even that we should use git push to publish our local commits. Local in this sense doesn't necessarily mean your own computer, it means your own local repository. So this is on CPSC server still. And this is our local system in this case, and the remote system is GitHub's own servers. So if we want to send it, we would do git push. Then we can see that it looks like it succeeded. It compressed things, it write, wrote things, and it sent them across to github.com to our repository uh, that's stored there. So now if we go back to GitHub over here and refresh this page, you can see that this has been added. The text that we wrote in the terminal, it is a simple Java program, got written to the readme.md file that is stored on GitHub. We can also add things, of course. We can add a whole file. If I write like main.java and then put in some Java code real quick, um, let's say system.out.println, hello world. Uh, if we're just sort of making a simple Java program, we might start with this. And then I would go through several steps to send this to the GitHub website, the main repository. First, I would do git add to add it to the repository overall, just my local repository. Then I would do git commit, and we can say added um, main file with a simple main method for now, something like that. Save and quit this. And now we've added this commit to our local repository. Now, if I make changes to main.java and I want to go back, I can do it on my local repository. Or if I delete main.java, I can recover it from my local repository. But again, we have still not yet shared it with everybody else. To do that, we'll do the git push command, which will send all of our commits to the main repository, the centralized repository stored on GitHub. Now again, if I come back over here to the GitHub website, I refresh and you can see that main.java is now here. I can click on it and we can see the code that we put is put on here for browsing. If somebody else, one of our team members, downloads the repository now, of course they'll get not only the gitignore and the readme, but also the main.java that we added. All right, so now let's talk about how we pull changes. And so to do this, I have made another copy of this repository with my same user and I've pushed a change into it. So if I uh, refresh this, you'll see that I've put in a new file. This is in a separate version of the repository with the same user, but it works the same way as if it was a different user. So if somebody else added this method in here, it would work the same way. So let's come back to our terminal window where we're working on this project. And if we were to, let's say, make another change, let's say I change main.java, and I say, let's make this a little more interesting. Let's say we ask the user for their name and then greet them by name. So make a new scanner on system.in. Um, say string name is equal to in dot next line. I guess, oops. We'll say first um, 
enter your name, and then instead of saying hello world, we'll say them hello plus name. And then I'll have to do an import for this, import java.util.scanner, like that. And so I've made this program more interesting by putting in more stuff. And let's say I want to commit and push this. I can say git commit dash a and say added user interaction to main method, something like that. Then if I save and quit this, the commit again just works locally. If I try to do a git push, it shouldn't let me do that. If I try to say git push, it says rejected. This looks scary and uh, serious, but it's actually not that big of a deal. This is just saying that we're trying to push to the centralized repository, but we're not up to date. We can't make changes to the centralized repository because our own code is behind. It hasn't been updated yet. So you always have to pull before you're able to push. Um, you can see this is the most, uh, the most helpful line of this error message. Hint, git pull before pushing again. That's what we want to do. Updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref, the same, uh, the same repository, the same branch anyway. You may want to first integrate the remote changes before pushing again. The git uh, error messages are, I think, especially good. Most command line programs don't have error messages as good as Git. So if you get one, take the time to read it and try to understand what it's saying. In this one, it sort of tells us what we need to do. We need to do git pull first. We have this message, which uh, is a relatively new thing. It, it used to didn't give you this sort of option. But I guess that uh, now Git has different ways of reconciling this scenario. This is the standard one of merging them. I'm not sure why um, they now sort of make you pick the option for this. This is one of those Git config things. When we talked about Git in week five, we talked about how to configure it with the Git config file and the Git config command. But I'll just go ahead and run this one. Um, this says that we should try to merge changes, which again, it lists as the default strategy. Yeah, um, essentially, this is for when it didn't, it wouldn't happen in this case, but if we and our partner went off and did several commits that were different, how do we sort of like represent that in the history? If we do rebase, then it sort of merges them together in sort of one flat timeline, whereas merge sort of keeps them as separate things. Again, I'm, I'm not sure why it sort of makes us choose this. This always used to just be the default option. And then rebase was something that we could do uh, sort of more specifically with the specific command. But either way, once we've done that, once we say git config pull.rebase to false, then we should be able to do git pull. And now it has it asks us to do this commit message because we're merging these branches. And so when I save and quit, then it has downloaded us the most up-to-date things. Uh, this only happened because we had made changes before pulling our other changes. I'll try it again so you can see what will sort of happen the normal way. Now I have this factorial.java program. And that was the one that I made in the separate window within, with, uh, with another version of this repository so that we can see what it looks like when we're sort of behind. It makes us catch up first. Now if I do git status, it will tell us that we're ahead of origin main by two commits. One is merging in the code that in this scenario our partner made, this factorial method. And the other one is the change we made to the main method where we're putting in the scanner and stuff. So now we should be able to do git push, and all of the things are up to date. Now if we do git status, it tells us we're up to date, and there's nothing to commit. Everything is all hunky-dory and good. If I go back to the browser, now we should see all of these changes sort of put into place. If I refresh this, now the most recent commit is the merging of these branches where we pulled this in. Um, Again, we'll see, we'll see how this looks if we had done it in sort of the correct order of pulling first and then pushing. But now we have factorial.java, which contains these things, and main.java, which contains the updated code we put in with the scanner and stuff. So now the normal way that we should be doing this is we should always pull first. 
So let me go ahead and put in another little change into this. Okay, I've added in the other version of this that I had pulled up, I added a new, um, a new bit of code. I added uh, a documentation comment actually to the factorial.java file. So now if we go back to our terminal window, this would be like if our partner put in code. So always before we um, work on it, if we're sitting down to work at something, it's good to just always do a git pull first. So that way we don't have to do the merge thing that we just saw. If we do git pull, it gets us up to date, downloads the most recent changes, then we should be able to see with git status that we're up to date. And now if we work on something, even if it's the file that our partner worked on, then we should be able to do that just fine. So let me say, maybe I'll put in some code to check if the uh, number was negative, because it shouldn't be. So if I say like if x is less than 0 into this factorial method, I can throw an exception. Let's say throw new illegal argument exception, which should be done here. And it can be cannot compute factorial of negative number, something like that. Then now I should be able to commit and push this without problems because we're already up to date. I'll do git commit dash a and we'll say add exception to the factorial method for negative numbers. Numbers. Now I should be able to git push this just fine because we're already up to date. It doesn't give me any kind of errors or something. So always when you are working with git, when you're working on something with your teammates, you should always, when you pull up the project to work on it, do a git pull first to download all the changes, then work on things. And then when you're ready to share them, you can do a git push. You always pull first to make sure you're up to date. It makes sense because you don't want to be working on an out of date version of the project that would be sort of counterproductive anyway. So there's one last thing to talk about, which is what happens when you have a more serious merge conflict. So let's go back to our terminal window. And let's open up main.java. And I'm going to make a change to this that is like not easily merged. The last one, the last conflict we had was easily merged because we were dealing with a completely separate file. In that scenario, we were working on main.java and our partner was working on factorial.java. In general, when you're working on a team project, you should also sort of use like regular communication, you know, email or text or whatever to sort of talk about what you're working on. So this shouldn't happen terribly often, but it's possible with Git and GitHub that you and your teammate will change the same file in ways that aren't compatible. We can't just merge them together. So let's say we are going to make sure we're, pull, we're up to date first, of course, do a git pull. We see we're already up to date. So let's say we're making a change to this file where we pull this out into its own method. Let's say we make public string get name um, for the user. Um, I suppose it would have to be oops, um, static. And we're going to pull these things up into its own method. And here we'll say return name. And then here in main, instead of just calling name directly, we'll say hello get name. This uh, is a sort of substantive change to this, these two methods. We've introduced a new method, and we've gotten rid of one that already exists. So here I'm going to do git commit dash a to commit it locally and say um, refactor greeting code in main, perhaps. Something like that. Now we have it set up locally. Now let's uh, I'll simulate in another window our partner doing a similar thing. They're going to keep the code in the main method, but they're going to sort of rejigger it a little bit. They'll uh, change the prompt a little bit. Enter your name. So they've also now changed this code. And they'll also commit it locally. And they'll now, so now we have two sort of situations. We've changed the main.java file, and our partner has now also changed the main.java file. So now who has to deal with this problem is just who tries to push it to the centralized repository last. 
if we push the code, then we'll be up to date with the centralized repository. And our partner is going to have to deal with the fallout from this. So in this scenario, so that we can see how it's going to work, I'll say our partner gets there first. Our partner is going to push their version of this change to the centralized repository. So now we have, we are behind. We've made this change and it is now sort of going to be incompatible with what our partner has. So if we try to do git push, again, it's not going to let us because we are not up to date. So we'll do git pull. And now unfortunately, what's in the centralized repository isn't really going to be compatible with ours. So if we do a git pull, it's going to tell us this, conflict. I wish this put this in a red color like it does up here. This is actually sort of a more serious problem. So Git does its best to try to auto merge changes together. If you're working on separate files or even separate methods or separate parts of the same file, Git usually has no problem bringing them together seamlessly. But in this case, we've changed sort of fundamentally the same method and Git says, there's a merge conflict in main.java. It doesn't try to fix it. It leaves it up to you. It says automatic merge failed, fix the conflicts, and then commit the result. So if we open up main.java, we'll see that Git has changed it for us. If we open it up, it now looks like this. <laughs> um, we have this less than, less than, less than line, the equal sign line, and the greater than, greater than, greater than line. What these indicate is the parts of it that were different. <laughs> um, the part that's between the equal sign line and this hash line is what we got from the centralized repository. Head refers to sort of like our local copy of it. So this is what we put in here. Um, it, was, it was able to put this stuff in the code because that like sort of, at least in, in Git, Git's view, didn't conflict. But the lines between here and here were different. In our local version, we have the end of this method and the start of this method, which is returning hello. And in the other one, we have this sort of one that our partner committed where we asked, uh, said, hello, blah, 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 how are you? And so it's asking us to figure out how to fix this. Um, what you have to do when you have this situation is just make the file look like how you want it to look. You can either keep our version of it and delete their version, or you can keep their version or delete our version, or you could try to merge them together in some way that makes sense as best as you can. So in this scenario, what we can do is we can sort of try to keep our version and their version. So in our version, we pulled getting their name out into a separate method. And in their version, they added this little text that says, uh, how are you? So we can try to just make that work. So I'll keep sort of a merged version of these two. I'll put the get name call right here to make it like ours, but I'll leave the plus how are you part and get rid of that and get rid of that and get rid of that. Then I'll get rid of this line as well. And so now I've just tried to make the file look how I want it to look. We have our version uh, feature of having this method pulled out as a separate thing. And we have their code that they put in, which is adding this how are you message to the end of this. And so then once I make this look the way that I want it to, I should be able to do a git commit for this change. Oops, I have to do uh, um, git commit dash a to signify that I want to add all the changes that I've made. And it gives you this auto message, merge branch main. Um, and it tells us, in fact, that it looks like you may be committing a merge. Um, and we are, in fact. And so it leaves this sort of um, message in here. We can add to this if we want to. We can say, like, um, uh, keeping separate method call, but adding question as well. Whatever you want, sort of describe what changes it is. Or you can just keep the basic thing and let the user <laughs> figure it out if they're looking at the differences. And then once we do that, we should be able to do git push to update everything to the centralized repository. And so now if we come back there to the centralized repository, we should be able to refresh and then see the most up-to-date version of this, where if we click main.java, it should have this updated code like that. We can also, of course, browse our commits. So in just the short time we've been working on this, we've made 12 commits. So you can sort of go back in time on the GitHub website and go back and look at what the code looked like at any specific time. You can uh, browse the changes like this. This is oops, um, 
so, uh, what we put in and um, uh, what was taken out. And you can also sort of see the code directly by clicking Browse Files, which will give you the way the code looked like at that particular time. And you can sort of go back and forth um, between the different versions and things like that. That is how we can use Git along with GitHub to collaborate with multiple people. So the general workflow for this, if you're working on a, a group project, for instance, um, is that you and your partner will, one of you will create the project, and that person will add their teammates as collaborators to the project. Then you all clone what's there, what's already on GitHub. Then each of you, as you go to work on the project, will sit down at your computer. You'll first do a git pull to update to the most recent version um, if there's been any changes. Then you'll work on things. You'll commit the changes. When you're ready to share them, you'll push the changes. Then your teammate will sit down and pull the changes to get what you did and then add to it. If somebody has pushed changes while you have work that hasn't yet been pushed, then you have to do the merging thing. Usually that works okay, especially if you have good communication and you don't like trample on each other's work. What you do there is you first pull the changes. Usually GitHub or rather Git will be able to figure them out in a sensible way. If they don't, you just make the files look the way that they should look, then push them back to sort of complete the merge process. So that's it for this week. We've talked about how to use Git and GitHub to sort of do group projects. But even if you're working on something just alone, there are uh, valuable reasons to use GitHub as well. For one, it allows you to sort of keep track between multiple versions of the project um, that you have on different computers. So for instance, if you're in the computer lab, you can or rather, if you're on the CPSC server, you can have a version of the project that you have downloaded and are working on. Then you can also use Git and GitHub on just your own local computer, like your own laptop directly. And then if you make changes at one place, you can sync them between the other two places. Um, I do this myself a lot. I work on things sometimes on my office computer and then sometimes on my desktop. And if they're both hooked up to GitHub, then I can, even though I'm the only one doing the changes in this scenario, I can still use pull and push to keep the project in sync between multiple computers, which is pretty handy. Also, if you're working on something that's open source, you could potentially let other people see the project and make changes to it. I have had pro uh, projects that I have on GitHub where um, I have had strangers make changes to them and I accept the changes. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, in my CompSci 305 class, I have done um, programs for the Game Boy Advance, and I wrote a tile editor for the Game Boy Advance where you could like more easily make games, and that's the most popular thing I've ever written on GitHub. People have, um, you know, uh, submitted bug re like feature requests and bug uh, bug reports and stuff, and somebody even added major features to it, and I uh, accepted those. And so having your code on GitHub allows like other people to see it and interact with it, which can be cool. But even if you're just using it on your own, it is helpful as well. And especially if you are working on a group project while you're here at Mary Washington, it's really a helpful way of being able to work together. Then when you graduate and uh, perhaps go on to work in the software industry, using tools like GitHub are, is very, very, very common. It will be uh, a real benefit to you if you're comfortable with these tools now while you're a student. So that's why we are including them in this class and hopefully in your other classes, you'll be able to make good use of them. So that's all for this week. Thanks, bye.